I'm so glad to have your company today. It's really good for you to join me. And we're going to have a little look at a psalm, a story, and then think about some character from the book of Acts. May God bless you today. Let's look together at Psalm 113. And let's think about the wonderful things we can learn from it. The psalm says this. Praise you the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and for evermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house, and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Now, you will notice with me that the psalm starts with the expression, Praise ye the Lord, and it finishes with the same expression. And in between are causes for praise, as well as a call to praise. You know, the first verse reminds us that God is sovereign and should be praised. Praise ye the Lord. We have to praise him. We're his servants. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Servants should praise their Lord and Master. Praise the name of the Lord, the psalm says, reminding us that Praise reflects the name and the character of our God. You know, in verse 2, there is an eternal aspect to this praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and for evermore. God's praise is eternal. You know, some people reach a pinnacle of fame and they're well known and, and they're in the headlines and they're being praised and acknowledged. But it comes to an end. Everybody has their moment, they say. But God is an eternal being. His praise is forever. And it's not only eternal, but it's global. From the start of the day to the end, there is a global expression of praise. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. These are wonderful words, aren't they? And wonderful truth. And as this world goes in its normal rotation on its axis, praise starts at one end of the globe and it continues right till the end of every day, that 24 moving cycle from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The Lord is to be praised for his supreme glory. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above all the heavens. The Lord is supreme and therefore he's high above all nations and even the heavens, because God lives in the third uncreated heaven. Verse 5 says, Who is like unto the Lord, our God, who dwelleth on high. He's unique. He's got high status. He's above all, blessed forever, we would say. And yet verse 6 reminds us the Lord is a God who humbles himself despite being supreme and majestic he humbles himself to observe things that are in heaven and on earth it says he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth he he looks upon the activities of angelic beings in the heavens he looks upon the activities of men upon the earth oh, but i love when you come to verses seven and eight God's desire is to raise people up. Often people who are powerful and mighty, their desire is often to put people down. But God raises the poor out of the dust. He lives the needy out of the dunghill. He sets them amongst princes, the princes of his people. I always remember a man getting saved in Manchester, Alan, and Wesley Downs telling us of how this man quoted this verse, that God raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the dunghill, but he doesn't just lift them out. He sets them amongst princes, the princes of his people. Those who trust God are a princely group of people, not in earthly terms, but in God's classification, brought into blessings that are indescribable. 
And then, of course, we discover in the last verse that he makes the barren woman to keep house. God brings to those who cannot bring children into the world the joy of children. The joy of having those who she cares for. To be a joyful mother. God brings actual children into barren hearts, but he also brings surrogate children into people's lives. People who they love and care for and become family. No wonder he ends by saying, praise the name or praise ye the Lord. May we do that. Praise ye the Lord. We're continuing today with the story of Mary Jones. I love this story. It's based in Wales. It's set a long time ago. And if you were listening to the last uh, or the first instalment of the story, you will maybe have got to the point where she's learning to read. Not long after the school had opened, a Sunday school had been formed in the little Welsh chapel in the village two miles from where she lived. Many months and seasons went by when Mary was invited to read in front of the whole congregation one Sunday from the minister's, the, the preacher's own Bible. By now Mary was nine years old but she wasn't tall enough to see the pages properly so a wooden box was placed in the pulpit for her to stand on. With no mistakes at all, Mary read perfectly from God's word to all that were present. No one was more proud of Mary than her mother and her father. Beaming with joy, Mary walked home from chapel with a great big smile on her face and a new hope in her heart. That evening Mary was going to bed and as she did so she shared her desire with her parents. I simply must have my own Bible, she said. Her parents would have loved Mary to have had her own copy of the Bible. They understood how much it meant to it but Bibles were very expensive. They knew they could never afford one. Bibles are so expensive, said Mary's father as he sighed. We haven't much money. But Mary's heart was set on having a Bible. Mary sat in her bedroom and she prayed to God as she did every night. A Sunday school teacher had told them that it, even if it took two years, or, or should I say it, it would take two years to save for a Bible, Mary knew that it would probably in her case take a lot longer. Even if it takes me ten years to save for my own Welsh Bible, I will have one one day, she said to herself. Mary wanted a Bible in her own language so that she could learn more about the Lord Jesus. And she began to make plans about how she could save enough funds to afford a copy of the Bible in the future. And so the work began. Mary's mum and dad obtained a money box for her to put her money in and they put two half pennies in it. Wasn't much, but it was a start. When Mary had finished doing the jobs for her mum and dad, she would do jobs for other people. She would save every single penny that she received. She would look after children. She would babysit for some people. She would pick up sticks for other people, for a, a, an old lady and collect for her and help her. She would sweep a yard. She would make deliveries of things to people. She would feed the chickens. And she would work so happily because she had this great ambition to save for a Bible. I wonder if you've saved for things. And you value them because you've saved so hard and you don't just automatically get it or you don't pay for it. And you know, you pay for it when you've saved enough. You don't just get it and then pay for it later. She learned the value of saving. And the value of this Bible to her was immense. Sometimes Mary would even feed animals or work hard at local farms. She kept bees so that she could sell the honey to raise funds. When Mary was 11, she happened to find a purse with money in it while she was out walking. But it never crossed her mind to keep the money. On returning it to its rightful owner, Mary was rewarded with a silver sixpence. As a thank you, she added it to her savings. However, one day her dad took ill and he could no longer work. And Mary had to stay at home much more now to care for her father. And with unconditional kindness, she gladly used some of her savings 
Those things that she had saved so hard for her Bible, she used it to pay for her dad's medicine. Oh, Mary, the dream was looking less and less likely. Was her dream shattered? We're going to discover Mary, as she saves and as she gives to help her father, does she get a Bible one day? Well, join me again in the next episode to discover if she does or not. Let's visit Paul and Barnabas as they continue their missionary journey as we read it in the book of Acts chapter 14. It said there sat a certain man at Lystra impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leapt and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. They called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people and crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. With these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Paul and Barnabas are, of course, in Lystra, travelling through the countryside, telling people about the gospel. And this man, of course, just like Peter does in Acts chapter 3, they meet a man who's disabled and all his life he has been incapable of walking. He was a poor soul. He was dependent. He was poor. He was vulnerable. It was a lifelong problem and there seemed to be no future prospect of any help. I just wonder if this man had learned to trust in God. I wonder if this man had learned to cry out to God and ask God for help. Had he learned to be patient by trusting in God and that in the limited circumstances of his life, God could help him? I don't know. I just know it was a lifelong problem. And he had to sit and wait for a day when maybe it would change. But was there any possibility? It was hopeless. And yet here we find he meets Paul and Barnabas and Paul looks at him and he sees the man's prepared to trust in God. And this man, he is healed. Paul says to him, stand up upright on thy feet. And he leapt and walked. He was excited, wasn't he? And I see a man who's healed. His life is changed. He's liberated. What a future. That's what happens when a person becomes a Christian. They're liberated. Their life is changed. Their past is dealt with. Their future is different. It's a wonderful thing. Well, you know what happened? The people in the town, they saw what had happened and they used an act of God to worship their idolatrous deities. They, they thought they called Paul Mercurius and Barnabas Jupiter of course, these were gods like Zeus and Hercules, or the other way round, and they assumed that they were come down. But I want to tell you today that Paul took an act that God had done and used it as an opportunity to preach about the true and the living God. Oh, he, he runs amongst the people and he cries and he's, he's distressed, so he tears his clothes and he says to them, Sir, we're of men just like you. We've got the same shortcomings, the same failures. We're men of like passions with you. And we preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities. Those idols, like everything in our world, cannot help you. They're empty. They're pointless. He says, turn from them. Turn to the living God. He preached about repentance. He identified with the people. He pointed to their creator. He said, 
the living God made heaven and earth and all things that are in. He directed their minds to the goodness of God. He said, God has suffered, allowed you in the past, but he calls you to repent, to turn to the living God. He's the God who gives you rain and he's the God who gives you fruitful seasons and he's the God who fills your heart with food and gladness. The two basic needs of humanity, physical food and emotional strength, food and gladness. He points a pagan people to the living God. He does this in other passages as well. He points them to God, the saving God, and he directs them in other passages to Christ, the Son of God. I trust that we might rejoice to see how God works in the hearts of people through those who witness honestly and truthfully about God and his grace. As always, I'm so delighted that you've joined me today. It's great to talk to you from my home to your home. And it's a great privilege to share the wonderful things of God with you today. God bless you. Have a good day.